So welcome everyone to this uh, celebrity Q&A here at the University of York, the Department for Theatre, Film and Television, uh, and also hosted by the Digital Creativity Labs uh, here at York. Um, we're really excited. Um, I think we've got a set of people here that, in this constellation, have never been at a university before. Um, they're all heavyweights in their, in their um, respective fields. There are esports casters, talents, uh, commentators, players, um, and, and you know, people who really shape the industry. Um, so we are um, absolutely pleased to have them with us. Um, I'm going to go through them uh, one by one, and please give each of them a really, really good round of applause. My name is Florian Block. Um, together with my esteemed colleague Anders Strachan, I'm leading the research group on esports uh, at the Digital Creativity Labs, um, and we're excited that this event is happening here. The first person uh, I'm going to announce is someone. He's a professional Hearthstone player. Um, he is also a very well-known uh, Jinx TV uh, presenter. Please all welcome Vincent Deathsy Chu. Next online, a man that needs little introduction, a caster who has been in the esports scene for more than a decade. Toby Wan is one of the most prominent Dota 2 casters to date and has been to every international since its inception in 2011. He's considered to be the voice of Dota 2 and the most emblematic caster in the scene. Please welcome Toby Wan. He's one of the world's first professional esports and video game broadcaster, broadcast commentators, commentating on a myriad of games, including Quake, Counter-Strike, StarCraft II, and Dota II, and has, a, has broadcast in dozens of countries, including China, the United States, Singapore, Australia, and Denmark. He's a true veteran of the industry. Please all welcome Paul Redeye Chalona. I'll be getting an earful from him, he's a professional host, in contrast to me. Um, next in line, uh, someone who's a, a really prominent Dota 2 player and streamer, he's best known uh, for his outgoing and friendly personality, as well as his near boundless energy when working at UNS, which we all experience. Please welcome Jake, Sir Action Slacks, Kana. Next in line is a prominent UK streamer and really well known in the esports uh, cosplay and prop making scene. Uh, she has over 23,000 uh, followers on Twitch and recently interviewed the Game of Thrones cast. Uh, please welcome Tabitha Artifakes Lions. <laughs> Next in line. Um, a famous Dota 2 content creator and streamer. He does other games too. He's widely known in the Dota 2 community as the man with the iron stare. Uh, please welcome <laughs> Ted Purian Flex, Forsyth. Iron Man. Iron Stare. Iron Man. <laughs> I, I took this from Wikipedia. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, next in line, uh, he's a retired professional Dota 2 player from the Netherlands. He's widely known as one of the most popular Dota 2 streamers with an impressive half a million followers on Twitch and over 61 million total views on his videos. Please welcome We Sing 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 Huan. <laughs> and last but not least, uh, he is a, another famous Dota 2 caster. He's known for his energetic and engaged casting style, as well as his ability to cast with exceptional speed and clarity when the need arises. Please do welcome Owen Odipixel Davies. <laughs> Can, can we keep? It? Can we keep these mugs? You can. Okay. You can keep the mugs. Okay. 
Um, so first of all, um, all of these uh, lovely guests are here for us today um, in their own time. So it's, it's very generous. And um, we also want to um, uh, welcome uh, the people that are tuning in later on YouTube. This is all going to go online to share your wisdom with the world. Um, first of all, I wanted to start, you know, we've got really um, true pioneers of esports um, in the room. Um, uh, you know, um, back in the days, you know, the stigma is still in, in video games today, but back in the days you had no mainstream pass, uh, press covering the events, no glamour, no out outlandish prize pools, um, but some of, some of these uh, people were there uh, at the very start. So, um, Red Eye, I was wondering whether you can sort of share how esports felt um, back then in the days <laughs> of its inception compared to today. Uh, Question about the dawn of time. It's got to be red eye, right? Yeah. <laughs> back, back in 1837. <laughs> um, Wait, is this yeah, I think somewhere? I think the early. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. yeah okay. Cool. Um, yeah, I think I started playing competitive videos about 95, 96, and in those days we didn't really have, um, you know, completely different to what it looks like now. No stadiums, no organisations running stuff. We just didn't have anything, and um, I guess what if we wanted to run competitive tournaments, we just ran them ourselves. We just set up leagues or ladders or whatever. I mean, many times it was IRC, um, Internet Relay Chat, which we used back then, and we would just join a channel and everyone would go, right, let's decide who plays who, and then have some kind of final and we'll put five pound in it or something. Um, and that was the mid 90s. And then I guess by the late 90s, there were some tournament organizers. Uh, some of the early ones were Barry's World. Shout out to anyone who remembers Barry's World. Probably not even old enough to One remember. One guy. One guy, Barry's Wow. Yeah, Go Barry. Bro, I'm with you. <laughs> um, Jolt League I worked with as well. And I think basically for me, it was more like, uh, you know, I was a bit older than most people coming into gaming at that point. So I felt like I could help organize it a bit better because we just didn't have anything. We had nothing at all. So um, it's very much, I, I liken it to like, football and jumpers in the park I guess you know, you know that's what we would do as kids and we wanted to do that in the virtual world so um, yeah very disorganised virtually no prize money I think someone brought it up in fact Toby brought it up huh? yesterday my total winnings as a professional player are $89 <laughs> I, I, I won 12 15. events! <laughs> Wait, like, how is that, that possible? Well. Hey? You had to share that as well. I did have to share <laughs> most of that, yeah, unfortunately. So, yeah, we, we, we paid anything upwards of a couple of hundred pounds to get to an event um, that was held on LAN. And really, for us, it was about going to LAN, so we had 10 millisecond ping, because actually at home, we had 56k modems and we were getting 400 ping, mm. um, which sounds absurd these days. So, yeah, we've come a long way. What do you think about like pro players now? You know, you guys were like fighting for mouse pads. I mean, they're just stuff. they're just spoiled brats now, right? Um, <laughs> I mean, don't they have? They do have to go through more, don't they? Yeah, I they mean, do. You guys no, I mean, like, there, there is a little bit of me that misses the old days in the sense that it was much closer. You know, we we didn't travel quite as much. If we had four events in the year where we left the UK, that was considered pretty crazy. Um, to give you some context, I did 29 international events last year. Yeah. Uh, most of these guys on here did roughly the same, if not more. So, um, yeah, big events were rarer, and I think you, there was more camaraderie amongst a group of people. Mm. Um, but I get that now, even with the Dota stuff that we do, we, we kind of travel like a circus. Yeah. You know, it's like <laughs> all the casters and the talent and the players yeah. and the admins and the managers, and we all sort of move from one country to another around the world. And it's like, oh, hi, hey, Jake. Yeah. How, how, how are you? Well, I saw you last week. I don't care. Right, I mean, of course. Because <laughs> it, we saw you last week. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's still got that feel, but it was much more... Um, I don't know, less professional and serious, I guess, <laughs> 15 years ago. Sure. Mm. Yeah. Great. Um, t uh, Toby, you, you were there from the first TI, um, and you've sort of uh, experienced <coughs> that transition uh, from something that was certainly big um, to something that has, the, you know, has made the mainstream press for its ridiculous prize pool, I think. Was it 28 million uh, last year? 24, 25? Yeah. Well, so how did you how high it goes? How did you feel about that sort of transition? What, what, how did you experience that? You know, it was pretty cool to start with. Like when you're at Gamescom and everyone, like you have all these, all these people like, oh, let's go talk about gaming stuff. Like what's the biggest thing in gaming right now? And everyone at Gamescom is trying to like pin for like the biggest the biggest like PR and Valve come out and go like yeah 1.6 million dollars uh, we're gonna do a, do a tournament for that and everyone was talking about it because it was kind of like like we had our tiny little booth at Gamescom and it was so tiny and then if you walk across 
to the second hole, it was blizzard. The entire area was blizzard. Like they had an like one full wall was just their StarCraft two stage, and they had more like the entire thing. You're like, okay, and then you had like League of Legends going on, who had their own dedicated hall with ESL at that time, and everyone's just like, man, what the hell is this? And then this one tiny little box has 1.6 million dollars going out, and everyone was talking about it, and you're like, no, like the production was terrible. We had the Razor booth right next to us pumping up music so loud for Ray, Ray, like Razor, um, that we couldn't even hear each other talking because it was so damn loud. I, it was, yeah, it was, it was kind of stupid when you think about it, but it, but it worked. Like 1.6 million dollars put it on the map. Everything started like rising and rising, but after we cracked the 10 million, like it kind of reaches that diminishing return point. So I, I, I can't really say like it, it got better over time saying, hey, yeah, more money came in. Like, that's terrific. It was greater for the players, greater for an in interesting storyline. But beyond that, I don't think it's really mad at that point. Dota is unique in that, in that front. Yeah, awesome. There's almost too much money. Great. Um, <laughs> I, I just thought I'd give uh, you don't, you don't get any each the money one slides. of you like uh, maybe w one or two minutes. I think we'd all really like to, I mean, we, we know where you are now, but um, I think... Uh, Paul talked about already, but why don't we start with uh, with Slacks? Um, how, um, did you, how did you get into esports? How did I get into <laughs> esports? That's uh, that's the worst example. And two minutes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, two minutes. All right. Well, I was making really annoying videos uh, on the internet, and then uh, I uh, did a Kickstarter for a new power cable <clears throat> for my computer for two hundred bucks. I went to work at Outback Steakhouse, and when I got home, uh, they the community gave me twelve k. So I spent it on a computer and tickets to TI, because I never saw an eSport in my life, went there, met Dendi, got obsessed with Dota, and then uh, put out some videos, and I got hired for my first eSport event after, and I've been still annoying ever since. So uh, <laughs> yeah, that's the, uh, the story. First event I actually Fantastic. met this Fantastic. Yeah. And then <laughs> one thing that's to another. Um, Archie, do you want to say a few words about how you, okay. how you work <coughs> relates to eSports and how you got into that, really? Yeah, so... Um, I got asked a commission. I got a commission by League of Legends Riot um, to make some. There's some League fans out there, right? Uh, that, that has to be. Any League fans here? <laughs> no. Oh. Get out. <laughs> um, so yeah, they commissioned us to make some props for them. On uh, so we streamed it and everyone loved it. And ESL sort of saw it and was like, oh can you come to an event and make a trophy for us and then we can give the trophy to the winners at the end of like the competition. And it's sort of slowly, that's how it progressed and like more trophies, more props for the companies, for the games. And um, so that's how I got into esports really. Yeah, it did, awesome. I didn't plan it, I'm a gamer. It just sort of happened <coughs> gradually. Cool, Ted? Hello. Hi. Um, I just sort of fell into it because there wasn't really that much talent around at that time. There really wasn't. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> like, Except for, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, when I started doing it, yeah, yeah. like five years ago, yeah. there was like one or two people doing interviews. There was Toby and LD and a few other people casting that have yeah. sort of since disappeared. And one or two people maybe on panels and things like that. And they were scrabbling around for people. And then they were like, hey, this guy's just done some videos on YouTube about Dota. Let's invite him. And that was it. Um, you, you said there's this one video that, that made you big, where you drew your... The Guide to Dota, yeah. yeah that was just MS Dota. Paint. I just did it because I'd done one for EVE, which I used to play a lot of EVE Online. Anyone play EVE Online? No? Good for you. Hey, so, <laughs> they weren't big. Really? Yeah. I can't yeah, see. Nice. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I did a Guide to EVE, and then I stopped playing EVE, like all sane people do, and I decided to play Dota instead, and I did... It was just for my mates. And then it, for some reason, made it onto Reddit, and that was that. And then Valve got in contact with me shortly after that, and I was like, what the hell is going on? So it really snowballed. Awesome. I guess the, the, the true lesson here is uh, use MS Paint more. MS right? Paint, if you, if you Windows Live esports. Movie Maker, which they ruined in the most recent... They're getting rid of it. <laughs> yeah, it's a joke. They're yeah. destroying thousands of future esports careers. They are. The, one they are. Face. the free tools exactly. are what makes it possible. Mm -hmm. Sing Sing, you have uh, had quite a ride in, in Dota. Yeah, um, how did well, you get into that? For me, it was just kind of natural. I was just naturally drawn towards it because I just played games like 14 to 16 hours a day. Yeah. I just kind of fell into it by myself. Yes. It wasn't very special, honestly. 
How, what did you get picked up though? What was that process like? From going from um, like a guy who's just addicted to games to it's just like you have a bunch of friends like let's sign up for this qualifier and then suddenly we do well and then it just snowballs out of control like that. Ah. And then something. you're on the scene, right? You're like established and people know you. And well, not really. I mean, there was nobody really established except for like Navi or like Metro Makers or something at the time. So we just kind of showed up all the time to qualifiers and we kept winning. Right. That, that's amazing. <laughs> we just kept winning. Well, we kept winning because the main teams, they kept getting invited. So we just fought all the shitters and we kept beating the shitters. <laughs> Get good. Yeah, for sure. Excellent. Um, Owen. Yeah. So uh, my, mine's sort of, sim sort of a similar story to the same vein of, t of Ted's, where it's sort of unintentional uh, and very fortunate as well with the sort of series of events that I had, where it sort of started out commentating um, as a thing to do because I didn't really know what else I wanted to do in life, and I knew that this was something that I enjoyed. It was this game that I played, and it was something that I could do that uh, a small group of people would appreciate. And uh, it sort of turned into a large group of people that appreciated and I had a, a sort of key event where I was commentating at home uh, a game that ended up being quite a memorable game because it ended up lasting three hours and a half, which is, uh, <laughs> you don't know Dota, it's a very sort of extraordinary length for the game to occur. Mm. And that got me a lot of sort of, uh, you know, people talking about me on the social media, which sort of gave me this sort of meteoric rise to actually being able to go to the actual events with sort of these guys, you know, the real pro yeah. players, the real the guys who actually know what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. And Owen's yeah. underselling it, because when he cast that three-hour game, <laughs> I, I think it was modest. at the same peak volume and energy for three and a half hours, <laughs> and nobody had really done that before. And mm. he was like, from that to, oh, you can cast a TI. And it was like, what happened? Like, he was just a guy that I used to play Dota with, and now he's like a main stage cast. I was like, what the fuck? Awesome. So jealous. Awesome. <laughs> uh, Vincent, sorry, we haven't forgotten about Hi. you. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. So, as everyone else said, for me it was quite similar, a very natural progression. It was very casual to begin with. I've played uh, at a competitive level, or like at least within the game, a very top tier level in like Tetris, Mahjong, uh, Magic the Gathering. Currently I'm playing Hearthstone, before I've played um, uh, so like some MMOs as well for two years, just like top of the MMO. Um, and the thing is that when you're doing something, you're doing it a lot, and if you're doing it a lot, you're really passionate about it, and if you're really passionate about it, you find more ways in which you can do the thing that you're passionate about. So for me, I just wanted to talk about more about Hearthstone. I got really addicted to Hearthstone. Uh, I love card games. I love the uh, just tossing a coin of fate and seeing which side it lands on if you're, you know, if you're dead or alive. <laughs> and... Um, after that, I just wanted to talk more about Hearthstone, and uh, little by little, people are like, hey, I like how you talk about Hearthstone. Come talk, <laughs> talk to us about stuff that uh, you don't know anything about. And so that's essentially what I'm doing a lot of now. Uh, on television, a lot of people, especially in South Africa, come to me for like their eSports news, which is um, quite questionable, but yeah, <laughs> it's fun, fun. So what I'm hearing um, from most of you is that there's a certain, you know, um, accidental element there. Um, the other thing that I'm really hearing strongly, and I had a few chats with you uh, uh, yesterday, um, Paul, with you, a particular one that, that I remember, um, the role of passion, you know, because particularly esports has never been always like this, and um, I think a lot, of, a lot of it is fueled by passion. And I just want to hear and bring out to the audience and the people online what fuels your passion for esports. Paul, do you want to start? Uh, what, sorry, what, what fuel? What fuel you, what's, the th what's the thing about esports that gets you passionate, that <sighs> makes you like go the extra mile uh, and then take in all these you know, difficult situations, a long, long career and, and, yeah. and yeah, to the point where now? I, I think what drives me most is that I'm super competitive. Um, you know, uh, whether it be playing darts with friends in the pub or <laughs> tempting bowling with the kids, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I just have to win, and it's kind of sad. Sorry, uh, kids. I know, sorry, kids. Uh, they'll grow up with a good dog. They'll understand what winning means, I guess. Um, yeah, there was none of that namby pamby go to school, everyone's a winner thing for us. Uh, you finish second, what the hell are you doing? Um, in, in the egg and spoon race. Um, so yeah, I'm super competitive. Um, I think eSports lends itself naturally uh, to that, obviously, because it, it's got so many competitive angles to it across you know, a range of games. Uh, even games like Hearthstone, for instance. Uh, <laughs> Why? It's all right, we're good friends. Um, 
Yeah, so I think that that's my initial driver is, is the competitive stuff. Um, and it's partly why I do a lot of Dota, because I really enjoy I think it's probably the most competitive game out there right now. Um, the skill ceiling is just ridiculously high. And when you see players do things that you kind of go, yeah, that makes sense in the game, but I didn't even know you could do that. And I've played this game for a long time. How is that possible? Um, and you see team play and the way that they, these guys play. It, it's just magical. Um, so I think it's a mixture for me. It's mostly competitive, but because I'm now um, of a very elderly age um, with slippers and walking cane and what have you, um, at least in this world, obviously I can't compete anymore. Um, I'm just too slow, uh, as Toby will attest when we play Overwatch. Um, but I can get the same kind of feel for it and I can kind of channel it through other players and watch other <coughs> players. And I explained it like this to a friend of mine recently when he said, I don't understand, you're watching people play other video games. It just doesn't make sense to me. And I said to him, have you ever enjoyed a Wayne Rooney overhead kick? He's a Man United fan. And he said, yeah, the one he scored against Man City the other year. We won the title on that. And I was like, exactly, right? And I get the same buzz of watching something like that in a match of Dodo, whether it's this guy casting at TI for $10 million in a match or whether it's Owen casting for three hours. It doesn't matter to me. It's about those moments which are special and, and just unique to my world, my esports world. I feel like it's, you know, when I'm watching, I'm the only one watching. No one else knows what this stuff is. It's just mine. And I, I think probably we all share that um, when we watch esports. And, and so it has a very, very special part of me, I guess, within it. And uh, there's a, another great example with League of Legends. Not that I use much of League of Legends examples, mm. you'll understand, because I'm kind it's of outnumbered fine. here. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's an e-sport. Yeah, no, not quite, yeah. Uh, they, um, they hired a band that I really like, Imagine Dragons, a few years ago, to do the theme song uh, for the World Cup, World, World Championship for them, uh, and it's called Warriors. And if you listen to the lyrics, it's, it's literally about how we started esports. And so it really kind of touched me as a, you know, wow, that, like this song means something to me. And it's a League of Legends song, which doesn't make any mm. sense to me, but <laughs> I got it, right? And that was really cool. And I think they tapped into something that we don't talk an awful lot about um, within esports. And, and I'm often saying, yeah, passion drives a lot of us as to what we do. And people just kind of joke, yeah, yeah, passion, yeah, get it. Yeah, you have to have passion, whatever. But it, it's so true. You've heard every one of these stories and they all match. We all got into this by mistake. None of us really set out and went, yeah, I'm going to be a host. No one does that, not, not us, right? We, because we didn't have those things back in the day. Um, we knew we wanted to do something within this industry, but we didn't know what. Um, but we're all connected by that one passion. Yeah, I mean, it kind of goes past passion and kind of <laughs> obsession. Like, I know a yeah. lot of people that want to get into esports and they're like, I really want to you know, do this and I think I could be good at that and they're never going to be able to do it because the only reason I'm in this is because if I wasn't in esports I'd still be playing Dota for 14 hours a day like it's <laughs> literally my only way to survive with that horrible obsession and uh, you know it's like uh, yeah it's the only way to make it through if you're not somebody that can like just be obsessed with something then you can't make it in this field and I guess that's it's kind of like a vice for me I know when I was a kid I would just constantly play my N64 and stuff I ditched class in college thank God for that college degree that I have <laughs> Where I ditched class to play Dota, and now I am doing that. So, well, quickly, no, we don't. Good advice, we don't yeah. it is. encourage. Yeah. Yeah. We are at a university. We do not I encourage no, ditching no. classes. Uh, for the no, record, I, so say... I want to distance myself from that. Side. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I will say though, like a lot of people now that esports is coming into its own, they think we want to get into esports, and that's almost what I would say the opposite thing to do. Go get a really good education, find something that you're passionate in, and then move that into esports. Like See, college was the best thing I ever did. Th that's what that's what I wanted to because you know things aren't going to be like this anymore. There's going to be a lot of students, um, people who want to have a targeted career in esports, yeah. and as this sort of professionalization is going on, what role do you think the university should play in this whole process? Uh, you mean like in terms things? of a course or yeah in general like a sort of um, f f you know f uh, yeah providing course offerings but also you know essentially uh, folding a, a formula providing a formalized path into some of the I things I, that I, you guys are doing. I don't know what the rest of the guys think. I don't think you could formalize a route in mm -hmm. because every game is going to be different. Mm -hmm. The scene is going to be different. It's more about genuinely more about how you get in there and, and you know who you know and how it goes at events and what what people make of your stuff you can't formalize 
getting a video that's popular on, on YouTube. Mm -hmm. You can't formalize that. I mean, mm -hmm. you could try, but it would suck. So, because <laughs> most, most people that set out to make a viral video, you instantly see. It's like garbage, right? So, it's, mm. you know, the things that people respond to are things that are genuine. So, how do you tell someone, we're going to teach you how to really make something from the heart? It's like, no. You well, I think you could, you could teach the fundamentals, though. I think that's about what, what? Video yeah. editing and stuff? Yeah, yeah. yeah but those like, courses already wanna, exist. We're talking we about do specific that? to esports. Yeah, so mm. what I'm saying is, is you can combine the two things. Yeah. Right? You, yeah. Can, you can have all of that. The university can give you all of that. And if you've got the passion like Jake has, he then you can turn videos, it into that. Then you combine yeah, yeah. those two things. I think that's great. Like there, are, I think there are enough courses out there to do. If you want to do film editing or video editing or yeah. all that kind of stuff, do that. But Jake. don't say, I, "Screw all that. I'm just going to go into esports." I think you get that base, and then yeah, like Paul said, you could then turn that to. I a, mean, yeah, that's what happened with us. But I, I imagine five years from now, you know, when esports. Do well, you think is, there'll be formal esports host courses? What I think that well, esports with lecture and all. There's yeah, already, already esports courses. I think it's bad. When yeah. when esports <clears throat> is as big as sports, you know, this is like the gold rush period of esports because it's forming. It's not solid yet. You know, people True. raise a yeah. uh, million dollars for a tournament and then run away. And <laughs> like, because we don't have, talk about right, we don't have like the institutions ready yet. And it really in these formative <laughs> years of what I truly believe will rival traditional sports as more and more old people die. Um, <laughs> the, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> well, you'll be with us, friend. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, in these formative years, it's really you get to bring what you learn in like institutions and college and stuff and you f shape esports like a, Seven years ago, my job probably didn't exist. Uh, like making content and making it like. I thought you were going to say Outback Steakhouse. Man. No, that existed. <laughs> okay. Thank God, great steaks. Uh, but um, no, like the really the innovative talent are the guys that learn about the world and learn about life and have an education and then bring that into the scene and adapt it to their own. So I think like having fundamentals and stuff like you know film. Public speaking, psychology, I mean, these are all super helpful in uh, making right. sure that you're successful. That's what I'm saying sports. is that that's good, but you don't need to have a specific course that says this is film editing, video editing for esports, because it could just be film and video editing. And no, then I, if you're into esports, you'll, you'll be passionate enough to turn it to that. I, I, I don't know. I, I sort of disagree. I think there should be more of a focus in driving people down that, that more specific route, because yeah, I've been at a lot of events and the quality of sort of a lot of the work that goes on is it's not great. There's so much room for improvement. There are a lot of people that that work behind the scenes. They just they, they don't they know what they're doing, maybe in terms of a, a professional outside of esports sense, but they have no idea how to sort of translate those skills into a way that's going to make a fluid show. You know, they, they, I've lost count of the amount of events that have, <laughs> have just had things go wrong because yeah, yeah. of these reasons, because people don't know how to correctly sort of interact and, and create a product that sort of the, well not necessarily the youth today, any sort of a fan of gaming today is, is gonna receive in a positive manner. What kind manner. of stuff do you think that they would have to teach? What, what would you, like if you had a course well, about esports, what would be the three, like you're teaching I mean, someone how to produce a, a tournament. Yeah. What, what do you think they would need to learn that would be different, that they, there wouldn't just be a question of experience? I think, I what mean, would I th you teach them? I think for a start you need to sort of be able to to maybe even subcategorize into the the genre of the games, there there are huge esport titles uh, that are incredibly different. You know, I'm doing a production for a MOBA is very different uh, to doing a production to, to a card game or a first person shooter. Mm. And I think absolutely, you know, in sort of a, uh, a a university, having the ability to work with people that are passionate about these individual gaming gaming genres, I think it's a little harder to be more specific. You know as much as people would hate, you know, put Dota and League of Legends like together, they, they do have very similar yeah, sort yeah. of aspects in terms of how yeah. those games are to be covered. Desi, uh, you've so just finished your degree. Yes. Congrats. Um, you have a thought on that? Sure, so I've just finished my degree, my master's degree at the London School of Economics while I was doing full, full time everything. I just do full time awesome. everything 100% of the time. Wow. But, um, but I definitely agree with Owen's point. Uh, personally, I don't think that it has to be necessarily an esports degree, but I think uh, having esports elements to already existing degrees, yes. whether they're sociology, psychology, whether yes. it's film yes. and television, is very, very valuable because anyone who's worked in production in esports understands that people in esports don't really know how to make anything. So we have to rely a lot on people from film, television, who actually have done uh, professional, I guess you could say. I mean, that's a bit rude, but professional, um, professional uh, production. <coughs> before and 
there is a lot of room for improvement. There is a lot of uh, room to explore everything. So for example, in sociology and psychology, if we're looking at us uh, like sleep disorders, for example, that's something that we can look into relating that to esports because a lot of us have like insomnia and stuff like that. It's just a normal thing. Um, I think that is very valuable and that has not been explored yet and it has to be explored. Good. I'd, I'd also so, like to yeah, pick please. up a point on this Maybe, as well, maybe so a minute or two if possible, yeah. The biggest compliment I can give to the people we worked with yesterday when we were filming here is that I can't remember any of their names. Oh. And I know that sounds what weird. What about Liam? Yeah, Liam. 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 God damn it, Liam. Uh, apart from Liam, if he's here, Liam, yeah. you suck. Shh. Now, the thing is, here's, here's why. Because all the people we worked with yesterday, who, by the way, are all from here, right, did a great job. And they did the jobs we, as talent, would expect them to do as part of a normal broadcast. So we didn't have any major issues. Therefore, we didn't need to interact with them. And so that, I think, was the best advert for me for if you can learn the core skills of the roles that you're here to do and then transfer them to esports, you will do yeah. very well. And the good news for you over the next few years is that the majority of people in the background of broadcasting are still in esports broadcasting because they're passionate and they don't have the skills or the knowledge or the experience that you guys are going to gain from doing this. So I think there's well, some very Paul. big... And then uh, I can just echo, we, we've got a really great set of Sparky students and then great lecturers in, in, in that program. Um, now, um, as far as university goes, it splits into teaching and, and research. Um, now, esports has become a, a very fertile area for innovation. Um, there's been broadcasts in VR, there's been augmented reality uh, additions on top of tournaments for the audience and the viewers, uh, an interactive viewing experience. But Esports really has become an industry driven by, de uh, by big data. So just uh, Dota alone generates 1.2 million matches, uh, terabytes of data, exact gameplay recordings every day. And this is really not just statistics. This is stuff that contains entertaining moments, that contains exciting stories. Um, I wanted to know from you what, what the, the role of data is for, for your work. Does that make sense, some of the casters? If you could elaborate, I guess. Well, so what's the role of statistics in, in, your, um, in, in your work? I mean, Toby, I know you... Um, yeah, we've, we've, we've talked about this before. Mm. Uh, like, for myself, and I think Owen's probably going to be a very similar situation too, play-by-play -play casters, uh, we normally ignore statistics because it messes with the storyline a lot. Um, so for us, like when someone always comes up and says, hey, we want to try and combine statistics and facts into like the actual cast when the match is going on, yeah. it's very, very difficult because it's, it's hard to keep the storyline flowing and then go to a statistic which is then at that moment, at that very point in your conversation, applicable. Mm -hmm. So at that point, you almost pull it back and say the grounds you want to start using like data is the educational side of things, the analyst side of things. So this in ways can be used by the analyst caster, but it's better to even break it down to a way that can be consumed when you have, well, Red Eye's area, when you, when you get to a panel and you can find new and creative ways to display the data which comes out of the game mm. in a way that someone who's sitting at home, Joe Blow, can actually understand what the hell just happened. Because Dota is a very, very complicated game. You're pulling in all yeah. this terabyte, you're pulling in all this data. It's great if you've got data, but it's useless if no one can understand it. And understand it in a way that they understand it, not just, well, okay, let me just take some time to read this graph and fully understand this and now I think I'm okay, but by that point the panel's moved on to the next point. So it's very difficult, I think, to, uh, to really at the moment provide data which is useful. I have a question for mm -hmm. my boy Singh. Pro players, do they actually care about like data and stuff? Do you like go out and see like who's the most picked hero or is it all like a gut thing? Uh, no, for sure they care. Sure. You will target specific players <coughs> to what they play and what they're bad against. Yeah. You will ban them, you pick against them, and there's a lot of things you can do. Even to the point where you can see well, what lanes they play. Yeah, so you like actually actively look at stuff like item pick rates and all that stuff. It's not gut? I thought it was all gut with you guys. No, no way. You can, you can even analyze uh, the laning play style people have. Mm. Like you have some really defensive mid laners way back, like when Boba still played mid, for example. He was a very defensive player. You can play around that. You put more defensive heroes mid for yourself, for example, or extremely aggressive, but never neutral ones. Yeah, I mean, that's what makes... Esports super interesting, right? It's not like a traditional sport. You don't know exactly how fast that guy can run in real life, but mm. in esport, you do. <laughs> Everything's recorded, you know. Yes. So it's it's got a lot more to do with the mind, right? Yeah. 
I mean, data for me, it don't mean much, uh, to be honest with you. Um, it's, uh, I will say one thing, like, uh, you know, one, one hard thing about doing eSports stuff is that you're, you have to be a personality, you have to represent yourself, and uh, you have to sometimes go past yourself and just see what empirical, empirically works. Um, I know that I find a lot of things really funny that statistically not a lot of people do. And it, it sounds weird, but it's true. When I was first coming out, like, I would just do some crazy, cringy stuff that I would watch and just die. And then I got this job at Dota Cinema where these videos were going out to, like, three million people. And then I'm like, okay, a lot of people do not like this. And it, you have to kind of accept that and change what you do. But, um, I, yeah, I mean, data's good for finding out what helps with the... Most people and the happiest aggregate happy people, but <laughs> screw those people. They don't know what's yeah. like, so I don't so, know. So you guys are all here sort of as part of um, something that Best Meta is doing um, and this uh, exciting new platform. I think the highlight here is to, you know, you have in eSports the, the massive productions with big crews and, mm -hmm. and you've got all the professional roles fit in. But then you guys are also producing your own content. Um, uh, are you, do you miss any tools? In other words, um, if you had a, a f creative tools for, for augmenting your content, do you have the, the toolbox that you need or do you feel if you had a wish list for, for next Christmas, uh, wink wink, if, if there's anything that you need, um, uh, what, what would it be? Are you actually offering that? Because the wink wink implies... I'm not, well, okay. I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah, it's not contractually. Okay, so you're not, you're not going to actually get me a Christmas present with this. <laughs> you know what? Maybe I'll Maybe do. you would. Maybe I'll actually do it. I think, I mean, in terms of streaming, I would love to have more stuff um, that, like, that I could just have a, a simple production thing to bring on animations and things that I could use. It, like, there, it is there, but I'm just not smart enough. So I would love a thing where I can just push a button and something happens, and, and it's nice and big and shiny. That's what I would like, rather than the more complicated interfaces. Excellent. For me, it's not like physical things. It's knowledge and time. Um, when you're a content creator, there's a lot of time going out that you're spending on social media, so you don't have time to get the skill sets that you would learn at university, like, say, the video editing. I would just love to have some time, have some knowledge, and be like, OK, let's put it together and upgrade my skill set. Mm -hmm. nice. OK. I think, I think as well, uh, something that for me, it seems like an obvious untapped market um, is being able to sort of pro provide some sort of a tool for a, a lot of the aspiring commentators in esports mm. because one of the things that helped me get noticed was the fact that uh, I was a music technology student, so I was very much about the audio and the stuff. So when I did my commentating, I was very particular about how I sounded it on sounded the stream. sounded great, is what it was. Which instantly was something that in sort of a sea of a lot of people that are trying to get themselves known sort of stands you apart. So if you're able to step up the production in any sort of way, and if, with regards to sort of data and visual stuff, uh, if people were able to access some sort of a tool that could allow them to do these sort of the, the, this live data regarding like statistics, that they can sort of self-manage and self-control themselves whilst uh, covering games, instantly, People would pick up on that. People would start saying, this guy, you know, he is a step above the rest. Because at the moment, you know, there's you know, hundreds of people that are commentating games, you know, just using like their gaming headsets and uh, some webcam, you know, which is absolutely fine. You know, I understand, you know, for, for a lot of people, they, do, they don't have the funding, they don't have the resources, that's understandable. But for people that do want to take it seriously, if there was an opportunity for them to subscribe to some sort of a tool that instantly uh, allowed them, as I say, to have these sort of graphs, this data that sort of pulled from the game, uh, that they were live covering, people would absolutely notice it. It would definitely sort of give people uh, who wouldn't have got a boost otherwise in terms of recognition uh, that bit of a jump that you do need to, to sort of get noticed in esports. Brilliant. We're going to get to a few audience questions in a little bit. Um, first, I wanted to say, like, let's take a critical look at esports. Um, we've talked a lot about the excitement, the passion, the motivations that each of one, one of you have. Um, but obviously, they're, they're, they're prone to be some growth pains um, in an industry that's really kind of shot out of the ground. Um, what do you think if you, uh, are the biggest challenges in esports for, for today and for the next 10 years? Actually, almost, I, I want to say one which we were almost debating on this panel before, where Tez just like, don't learn video editing, don't learn this kind of stuff, like, stay with what you got, we don't need to funk, like, get a course on I didn't on say this. that specifically. That's exactly Not specifically, what but I'll paraphrase it. I didn't that. even say that at all, though. I was <laughs> <laughs> 
Like, I'm, I was literally saying that those skills already exist and you can learn them, but you don't need to have a course that's like video editing for esports. Because if you love esports, you'll be able to learn video editing and then turn it into esports video editing. That's all I'm saying, homie. Okay, okay. then ignore everything I just said there. And, um, you weren't I, listening, is what it is. I, Go on. I was going to use you as a wonderful platform. Now, okay. no, my don't. platform's shit. Um, but for me, I think staying true to what we are. Uh, to what uh, esports was built on, like Red was talking about his community. I can use you, right? You said talk about community. Yeah, great. <laughs> um, I didn't say anything of the sort. What <laughs> <I just said>? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, just making sure that we don't lose what makes us unique. Like when you when you start getting in involved in a lot of mainstream stuff, it's very easy just to have your product, your content bastardized into what they believe is good, digestible content, mm. and. There's a reason why things go viral on on, on, in, on the internet, or there's a reason why certain content is more popular than the other. And when you start dragging it in, you basically just cookie cutter it. It's it loses the the quality that comes from esports. It loses that personal touch that connects with the viewer. And I and I feel that a lot with mainstream media, where it's just like we're just going through the checklist of okay, we now start up the broadcast. This is what we do. Then we go to this. Then we go to that. And it's just like, well, well, what's the point? Like, okay, I can copy and paste this every single time, but what I'm watching is not unique. Mm. And I feel like esports, especially with transitioning games, with new technology, with new software, with new ways to actually consume the the, the broadcast, uh, that we need to keep thinking of unique things that push you to the front lines and don't just accept what is mainstream. In fact, if if we just sit there going, oh, if we make it to the Olympics, we've made it, boys. Like, no, that, that's actually, like, for me, that's, that's a disgusting thought because that's not making it. That's just becoming part of something that, that already exists. I want to be part of something better than that. Mm. Amen. Yeah. 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 Uh, Great. Uh, okay. One okay. answer. Yeah. Oh, oh no. Eight chairs, one opinion. Someone's Great. Mad. That that makes it easier. Um, uh, I want to talk about this a little bit. Um, it, you know, women in esports has been talked about a lot. Um, we're actually clocking in, according to the market research, about thirty percent women in the audience now. Um, I think you know, if you look at it as a trajectory, that's really promising because you know, only ten years ago that was very, very little. Um, but still, um, you know, there are still obvious barriers in place that that, that prevent women from making a, you know, the, the kind of jobs that all, all of you are doing. Um, and, and I don't want to point you out. You, you, I am. You're free, yeah, you're free yeah. to, you, it's you, kind of hard not to. Obviously, yeah. uh, the, uh, the, the, the one representative. But you know, uh, you don't. Do, do you want to open on, on giving giving us your sense? I can only speak from experience. Mm -hmm. um, so yes. don't take this as fact. Um, for me, I find that you have to work harder. Not harder, but the rewards are great as well. And then when you do get something fantastic, it's well, you're a girl. And if you don't get something fantastic, I was, we was, I was talking to Paul earlier, it's like, well, you're not good enough, that's why, because you're a girl. Um, I just think, and it doesn't matter if you're male or female, you just have to work hard. We all have this in common. Everyone on this panel has worked their butts off. And that's why we're in the industry that we are, because we put the passion in and we put the hard work in. So just have a thick skin, because you're going to have everyone tell you you can't do it. But we've all had that. Hmm. But just keep pushing through. You yeah, I think really, you, may yeah. Be, you may be underselling your achievement there, I think, because it is significantly harder having this <laughs> pressure um, from, from society yeah. and, and, and this, uh, this prejudice. Well, recently, you guys have heard of Twitch, I take it, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, I recently got banned on Twitch for 24 hours. Um, and I got banned because I was sick and tired of the chat, the people coming into my stream going, get your tits out. And I stream yeah. like this, I don't have a cleavage shown. And there's nothing wrong if you do, by the way. Unsubscribed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I had stress balls I, of, of boobies. And I, I pulled them out and went, here you are, guys. And I got banned for showing nipples on the stream. Okay. But guys can show nipples. So there is some kind yeah. of double standard there. But you know what, if, it's, what, if esports is what you want to do and get into, don't let anyone hold you back. Just, yeah. Just go for it. I mean, uh, one thing that we do probably have more than anybody else in any other field is like the need to have some super thick skin. And like, because you're a sports commentator on TV, people hate you. Maybe you hear it once in a while, maybe somebody tweets at you once every month, but we have the words of all 40,000 people telling you exactly what they think about you at all times. So uh, for uh, females getting in too, 
<laughs> it gotta just be incredibly tough. I mean, it's just uh, all the different things that people say about that. It's just so hard. I Without mean, being too masculine. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like the 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 expectations are always different too. And then a lot of organizers too are just pieces of garbage. You know, they want like the token girl, and then that's it. And when they have their token girl, then no one else can break into the scene because they already have that one. So it's like, it's a lot of challenges. But as you said, though, if you are able to overcome those challenges, I think there's just huge rewards, like guaranteed at everything that you want to go to if you've proven yourself to be successful. But man, I mean, <laughs> I am so happy that I am the gender I am uh, <laughs> and get to work in an eSports because I, 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 I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I probably wouldn't be a hot chick either, so I don't <laughs> <laughs> Okay, any other thoughts? Um, well, thanks, thanks for talking. I, I know everyone keeps on bringing it up, but I think we have to regularly bring it back to, to people's attention. Um, so now I'm going to go through a few audience questions. Um, someone wants to know, do you ever not have the energy or, God, yes. or desire to compete, and how do you deal with that? Is that directed at that someone that's, that's that's No, 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 I'm, not. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm just looking at random people. It's an everyone one. I, I think everyone on this panel will probably agree that we have massive burnout issues in this industry, massive. Uh, and whether you're a player, uh, a creator, a uh, YouTuber, Twitch streamer, host, doesn't matter what those roles are because esports, and I think this is a really critical thing for anyone who doesn't spend any time in the industry right now in terms of working in it, understands before you get yourself into this industry, it is 24-7, 365. There is no break. It never stops. Even when you're on holiday, you are checking Twitter every five minutes to make sure there's not some crazy social media scam going on. Because uh -huh. you don't want to miss out. Partly because you don't want to miss out. Partly because you don't want to miss any controversy or anything crazy goes on. Um, also, you want to try and keep up with everything. As a presenter and a host on these tournaments, I've, I cover maybe four or five different games a year, and I follow them on a regular basis. I watch a ton of streams when I'm not working. I do an awful lot of preparation for events. I'm never not doing something about esports. Even now in my spare time, I'm sitting in a university talking to you about esports. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, that's what I live for. I love it, right? Um, but it does lead to burnout. There's no doubt about it. I was very lucky that I got caught a couple of years ago by a good guy called Neville Upton at Gfinity who basically saw it in me and he was like, you are literally on the verge of a nervous breakdown. You are literally about to explode. You need to chill. You need to take time off. And he gave me a month off. And I swear to God, that was two years ago. If he hadn't told me to get on a plane and find a beach somewhere for 10 days and not turn my phone on, I probably wouldn't be in esports right now. And that's happened several times in my career over the last 15 years. I'm, I'm sure everyone in this panel has something similar. My kids. Like that's, that's my burnout, no, and I'm just like, either I haven't seen them in too long, or I've been with them too much, <laughs> then I'm just like, I either need to get away and do as many esports events as I can, or that's I need to stop working right now. Like, that's it. That, that's, they're like my, my gauge. Well, it's because you, you need someone else yeah. there, like, and uh, yeah, that, that's the thing for yeah. me, I think. I, and I think we, we've talked about this before we came in, but it's, I think the other key part of the aspect to understand with this is that it's, it affects your life. Yeah. Like anyone that, I, I don't want to make this a big, oh God, they're so hard done by, because we've got great jobs and we love yeah. our jobs and we're very privileged um, to earn the money that we do and, and be in an industry as fantastic as it is. But it doesn't come without sacrifice. Don't just listen to us going, yeah, it's passionate, it's awesome, and it's brilliant, it's great, because yeah. there's, there's other crap that comes with it. And um, it's not we're all the, different. the hours are the big Yeah, we're all different, right? Yeah. We all cope with it different. I do not cope well with loss, and I have lost an awful lot of things as a result of putting so much into it. Um, my family being part of it, so don't don't be blinded by the good stuff. The, you know, it does. There is some penalties involved yeah. as well. And so for me, um, in esports, there's a term called like a grinder. So like people who are essentially just playing all the time for points. Um, for example, in Hearthstone, as as much of a meme, meme as it is, people in Hearthstone they do put a lot of time into it. Sometimes, especially at the end of the month, you have like 20 hour days. You know, you go to sleep for four hours. Wake up, you don't eat, because the end of the month is really important. You can't waste a single moment. Um, and I think when it, when it really comes to that, even though you're really passionate about it, if you're spending so much time doing something, it's, it, it's, not, even, it's not only mentally painful, but it's physically painful. Um, so I was actually interested in asking Sing Sing, so because I know that Sing Sing streams so much Dota, and it's almost always Dota. 
that how do you manage like burnout? How how do you how do you get out of bed in the morning to like go back stream Dota? Oh, that's really easy for me. I just play older games. Oh, I'm yeah. just addicted to games in general, man. I play on everything. I have like every console I bought and I buy every game on Steam. <laughs> that's about it. If I don't play eight hours of Dota, well, I still do. I play like eight hours of Dota all day. And I play another eight hours of other games, and then I go to sleep and I wake up and do the same. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think uh, Paul and everybody's point is really true. I mean, there's merit in having a real a real job, but there's merit in having a typical career where you clock in and you clock out. Like go up, wake up, go there from eight to five, and then you're home to spend time with your wife and kids. Uh, no, not in this life. Um, you, There is never a clock off. When I'm in bed right before I go to sleep, I'm looking at shit, I'm reading shit, I'm thinking about Dota, I'm playing Dota, waking up at two o'clock after the wife goes to sleep so I can play four extra hours of Dota. Like, <laughs> it never ends. Uh, and that, that's, that's the life you gotta live if you wanna make it. I mean, you can't, you can't have two different lives in this industry. You have to 100% jump in or you're never gonna swim. The thing is, I think it's, it's interesting that the, we're, we're, we're all kind of committed to that. Mm -hmm. But if, if the person that you're with, whether your boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever, whatever your family setup is, if they're not committed to that, mm -hmm. oh. that is super hard to get past. Because like if you said, like I got into it really late and my wife has a regular job and she's like a normal person, like she's like a super normal person, right? <laughs> normal. And all her friends and all my friends are like really normal people. Mm -hmm. And they're like, what are you doing this weekend? And I'm like, oh, I'm going to China or I'm going, to do this and you know watch video games they're just like wow that's that's really interesting but they have no they can't yeah. relate to it so luckily my wife is like is it paying the bills and i was like well it's paying some of the bills she's like well then cool you can keep doing it <laughs> because if i was just doing this and not making any money i'm sacrificing way too much so i think you, you've got to find someone who's <coughs> willing to work with your fucked up schedule that you're going to have from doing this honestly yeah, you, better, you, you better keep your subs yeah. up yeah. 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 keep your subs up yeah you and better there's keep them up. Yeah. there's a point too where i think all of us have very lightly talked about it but there's always a point for everybody when you're going like oh up to 2 years of just doing stuff with no re rewards in this industry you know yeah. you're just grinding you're doing things and there's nothing coming your way and it's like that obsession gets you through because you'd be doing it anyway. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, I know a lot of people that have tried to get into this industry. They go for a year. No one's watching. They have 30 people watching them and they're waiting for that big breakout moment. Mm. And some people can't get through the wait. And uh, yeah, that breaks that, a lot. That, that comes back to something Owen picked up earlier, which is the none of us have actually mentioned it specifically, but luck does come into this. There is luck. Yeah, there is an element. Yeah. Definitely luck. Yeah. Yeah. I, would right, 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 right. I would never be a host yeah. if it wasn't for the fact that I turned up to an event once at Multiplayer and they needed a stage host and went, you've done commentary, can you do the hut? And I'm, not really, I've never done it before. You'll be fine, you'll be fine. <laughs> would never have done a stage host right. if I hadn't done that one gig. Because mm. I never had any ambitions to do it. Yeah, and it's a bit by luck. Yeah, there is a bit of luck yeah. to it. But luck is half education too. I mean, and it's uh, half it, hard work. Right, that's if, the point. Right? If you <laughs> didn't have <laughs> the harder you work, the luckier you get. Yeah. Right. If you didn't have all those skills before you had that lucky moment, then you wouldn't have made it. There's uh, for every example of somebody that's made it, there's someone that's had that same situation that completely well, bombed. <laughs> so, I, I yeah, think I would go as far as saying, you know, we've got eight exceptionally successful individuals here who've, you know, all of you have made it, but for, for each one of you, there's probably. A million who've, who've tr who are we trying. We had to kill well, a million people yeah. to get. <laughs> <laughs> We've not sold this. We don't thing, endorse no. killing. No. We no. don't endorse killing. Um, <laughs> one more audience question. Sure. Um, in esports, there's often animosity slash rival rivalries between games. Does this help <laughs> or hinder the industry? I think it's great. I think it helps. You need it. Yeah. I think I can't live without it. Yeah. It built, I mean, not just even within the game, but like. Oh, I don't remember either. Actually, yeah. Like yeah, League not, not versus Dota and stuff <laughs> yeah, like that. Yeah. That that drives like Dota fans to feel even more passionate about their game because they're like, no, our game's better, and it is stupid sometimes. You're like, <laughs> it's just a different game. But I do love it, and I really do hate League. Yeah, <laughs> I honestly do hate. Yeah, it so I actually much. have Can not hated feet? many things. I'm kind of safe for this one. I, I, it's weird for me because I'm actually um, slightly different to most of these guys, where they're one game orientated. Yeah. Uh, yes. I do t a ton of games. I think I've commentated on more than 50 or something. So mm -hmm. for me, I've I've kind of a bit of a nomad. I've never really settled in one place mm. and found my own thing. But I guess. Right now, it's it's Dota. It's been Dota for the last three years. You're well, one I've of us, Paul. Enjoyed one of us, <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I love Counter Strike. There's no no denying it. I love doing Counter Strike stuff, and um, there's been other games over the years. Starcraft Two, particular, I love doing, and still have an affinity with the fans. 
still get to watch some now and again. GSL is always still great to watch. So for me, it's weird because I kind of get that. If I do a StarCraft event after not doing one for a while, everyone's like, yay, StarCraft, Red Eye, awesome. And all the Dota fans are like, give him back, he's ours. And you're like, wait, what? No, I'm, I'm an eSports host. I, I do all sorts. And then if I do Dota, CS are like, oh, you've stolen Red Eye from us. Why have you stolen Red Eye? But you've got machine. What are you talking about? Yeah, but you stole him for Dota two weeks ago. And now you can have Red Eye. It's like, what are you guys talking about? Seriously. But that's how passionate the... the and I love that about the community. They are super passionate. They, they even hold on to their talent you know they're, they're like he's ours now and you're not having him back um and i, I think it's great from a you know rivalry point of view it's really cool as long as it doesn't get too out of hand um yeah. and i yeah. don't hate league you know well I, i'm a firm i'm an american i'm a firm believer in capitalism i always say that competition breeds innovation you know if well, we were all friends and holding hands all right we'd be dead Excellent. <laughs> well, maybe along those lines, uh, let's do a little bit for the, for the um, game industry. Um, one of the people in the audience wanted to know, are there new games that you think will become big uh, in eSports? Do you think you can predict that? Not PUBG. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely <laughs> PUBG. Seriously, this is the most dangerous question we yeah. ever get asked. Yeah. It's like, you couldn't dig this up in about three years ago and look. <laughs> Yeah. Well, look what he said. Yeah. Yeah. Not PUBG. So you look it up in that, three right? years. So if it is big, he just says PUBG. No. It's See, that's good. You did that well. No, I don't think you can predict it. And I think no, a lot of it's think of all the games. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. But think of all the companies out there that have said, we're going to make a new MOBA. And a few years ago, do you remember that? There was like 10 of them all yeah, out at the same I, time. I, I, all called crisis. Strife or Smite or some variation. Yeah. Angel Wars. Yeah. 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 Right. There was like a million of them. And they were all like, we're going to be a big eSport. We've invested a million dollars. This is going to be huge. And you're like, you're never going to make it, ever. Like, the yeah. games that made it took some time to get there. Yeah. Some of them arrived just like, yeah. pow, but not, not many. And but you've got to so hope some people pick it up. How quickly we forget about the Dota Home Wars? Dota Hong but it's yeah. it's, it's, I mean, it's supposed to be the bigger game. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. So, you know. But you're, you're drowning a genre which is not where the community is moving. Like, like you could see StarCraft 2, which was really fantastic. RTS was it, right? And then everyone started moving into more bigger community games. And we're like, yeah, okay, this is where it is. Like, it's, it's, it's the MOBA Dota. It's, it's the MOBA Dota genre. This is this is the age of this. And then where do you transition to next? Is it was was it the CS scene? It was the battle first, royale now? It's, it's, yeah, it's battle royale. It's first person yeah. shooters because everyone, the audience is growing and they're they're looking for more basic understanding of a game. So mm -hmm. it makes sense. We move into first person shooters with high tension levels. Where do we go after that? You never really know. You can't predict. Like, like yeah, because people, people like this is the whole technology side, technology and software. How far can you go? Like when virtual reality first came out, people were like, oh yeah, this could be really cool. I can, and then it's like, well, what's the actual use of it? No one can actually use the bloody thing and no one's making really good games that immerse you and actually say, I can be competitive, I can have a skill level in this. Yeah. So it's maybe happening. that gets solved yeah. and then we move into a whole different era. You just don't know. It depends on how fast technology moves. It depends on the audience you're pulling in as well, what they want, what do they want to consume, what are they bored of, what also, do they like, want well, to consume. A game will come out. There might be a genre that isn't currently yeah. big in esports. A game will come out that everybody goes nuts for, yeah. and suddenly it's like, wow, this guy's amazing at this whatever it is game. I don't know, it could be anything. So, yeah. you know, that comes out and that drives the esports down that direction. Yeah. So, yep. yeah, it's impossible to predict. Just Otherwise, yeah. you would just make that game. Right. Yeah. yeah, so like, I'm thinking like a card game FPS. You know what I mean? Nice. That's the next big <laughs> thing. That's big thing. Cool, like Gambit from X Men. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sick. No, I think you guys are—you pretty much hit hit the nail on the head with the community, right? I mean, you take PUBG and Overwatch. Uh, Blizzard is just pumping money trying to make Overwatch work. Here's a hundred million dollars, guys. It's never gonna work. The game's shit. But like, PUBG, a game that like nobody cares cared about when it first came out, had like made by some South Korean company from some guy's personal thing. Community loves it. It grows. They want it to be an esport more yeah. than the developer wants it to be an esport. I think they would like it, but you have to have a hundred computers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it just the makes problem. sense. Well, you you'd just, have you to have, fix you the have game. You have to have a consumable so. product. That's what it is. You have to have a competitive consumable product. That's right. all they need to work out. Uh, but PUBG was also like it was Armor Three. It was a it was a mod before exactly. that. Exactly. And like it's it's the history of something like that that can just develop and then get big. So it's knowing the fact that this mode existed for a very long time, but it didn't come into the big popularity until something specific happens. And this is how you follow the progression of esports. This is how you try and predict the progression of esports of like where do we go next? What's going to be popular? Like how many people have been waiting for Warcraft Four? to actually come out. Like, right. almost everyone's probably been waiting for this, but Blizzard, 
I don't want to say they're really smart after we talk about what they're doing with Overwatch. Right. Um, but they understand, like, this is not the time for an RTS to be released. The community... They, they've got w- too much other shit yeah, on their Yeah, they, they, they always leapfrog their esports events. Like, what's going to be popular now? This one's dying off, so we'll just kick in our next one. So when Overwatch dies in, well, two weeks, like, maybe <laughs> then they can think, okay, we should start the development of, of Warcraft 4 or whatever else we believe is going to be the next mode, the next genre. I think in, in terms of what would make it an esport as well is a lot of games that are made do not have a high skill cap. If you think about a lot of, a lot of games that are big in esports, there's a almost limitless skill cap to them. The ones that they try to make them kind of user friendly and everything like that eventually die yep. because there's just not the skill there for you to go, wow, that's unbelievable, and it doesn't keep getting better and better. Someone's just really good at it, another guy's really good at it, and you're like, well, they're both really good at it, but it's kind of boring. You want something that's like, holy shit, no one's ever done that in the history of Dota. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, some I idiot said it. <laughs> or leak, whenever. Oh, are they so, stealing that too from us? <laughs> I think there's, there's one other thing I'd like to say as well. Yeah, is, um, when I do lots of consultancy with non endemic brands, their questions are usually, where's will esports be in five years? And I always say, no idea. And they yeah, go, nobody but knows. you're supposed to be an expert. Yeah, no idea. Absolutely no idea. And anyone that tells you they do know is lying. Mm. Because there is no way any of us can predict where esports will be in five years from now or what games will be popular. No way. And five years really? is like an insanely long time. It's like 20 <laughs> years, yeah. 7 years. That's a career in yeah. esports. Yeah. Like, like a, ga- a game life goes from like seven to nine years if it's really, really popular. If yeah. it's not that popular, five years is maximum. So you've already changed the primary yeah. game. Like you've changed the top, the, the top three in esports. Yeah, and that's why we've, we've pretty much agreed that the Olympics is just bonkers yeah, the, the, because it's 2020 something or other which it's, no one knows what's going to be like if they yeah. say now we're going to we're going to use Dota I mean, well that's no good because I don't yeah. even know if it's going to exist and we're not even put, like bring up the point of the archaic system of like okay we're going to separate everyone into their different countries and this is the way it works like we've broken so many barriers yeah. through the internet and just through the way teams uh, are assembled like yeah Spirit of America sorry, Olympic, Olympic like they just kept, they kept adopting all, all the teams which were just compilation teams from Europe because they had one Canadian in it and it wasn't even an American team and they just it's an American uh, team. It, why are you just flaming NA? We're talking about the Olympics and they just flaming <laughs> NA Dota. That is the way. spirit of America. We allow anyone to be a citizen, unlike yep. the rest of you greedy countries. Yep, crazy. <laughs> anyway, you know how hard it is to get American sure citizens? Sure. If you want yeah. it hard enough, you yeah. can If have you want it, it, you can work hard. <laughs> I'm sorry, would you like to check my social media before I'm allowed into your country again? <laughs> no. <laughs> to, to just sort of go back to the topic again. Yes. Uh, I just want to say a very good well, well, well done, Owen. Thank you so much. Uh, I think on the short term, you have to look at Valve's new game, Artifact. That absolutely is going to be a huge... I mean, people laugh, card game, ha ha, Hearthstone's already done it, why do we want a new one? It's Valve, you know, when have Valve had a title that hasn't been successful? Ricochet. This game, this game... <laughs> right. this, oh, look, 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 Alien, Alien, Mr. Email of payment. <laughs> Alien <laughs> Swarm, Owen. No, honestly, <laughs> you laugh, but it, it, it is, it's going to be Valve's new title. That, in the short term, is definitely going to be a game to get in from the start. There's already massive organizations talking about how they're already sort of looking at getting people to, to play that game. So that game's going to be massive. And then in the long term, it's absolutely, I, don't, I have no idea on the time scale, but 10 years, it's got to be virtual reality. That eventually is going to be where esports sort of culminates. Mm. We don't know what the game's going to be, but VR is definitely... Someone will make a good game go. for VR yeah. at some point. <laughs> yeah. My vibe is gathering a lot time. of dust, because I, every time I get a game, I'm like, yeah, it would be cool if this was a real game, but it's like a five-minute yeah. demo. That I paid full um, price for. So. That's why you do what the smart take people time. did. Like it, just, yeah. just buy it in two years' time when it's cheaper, and I don't have to keep using controllers. Someone make me gloves, and I can go Minority Report and all this stuff. Okay. Please. I yeah. agree with you. List. You asked me for a wish list before. Minority Report. <laughs> Say again. I want Minority Report gloves for virtual reality. That's my wish oh. list for Christmas. You thinking. poor man. You thought we he was saying why something relevant. We all know why. No. That was a data question. Okay. That's the first project for best meta. I think. I agree with Owen. I feel like VR is definitely the future. If you could watch a football game where everyone's a virtual guy and they're all running at each other, ripping each other in half and shit. You know, you'd watch it. <laughs> oh, I mean American football, not soccer. That wouldn't make any sense. Yeah, you have to take Sorry. your hats off. US handballs. US handballs. All right, anyway. So, Paul has preempted my last question only 
since we were at university, I would have asked, uh, where is esports going to be in 10 years? Oh, no. <laughs> 10 years. Who, who, your question is who, who, twice who as bad as the Who asked that question? Yeah. Huh? Who asked that? Was it Liam? Yeah, did Liam ask that No, 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 no. That, that was something it, I came in as, as a cheesy uh, sort of uh, leeway oh, into uh, the end of the panel. But mm -hmm. um, I think it's been a, a great pleasure having you guys all here, um, hearing your thoughts. Um, this is a, an amazing opportunity. I want to give a big shout out to Best Matter. Um, who has brought all you lovely people here and for your time uh, uh, being here. Um, thank you to the Department of Theatre, Film and Television and the amazing crew, all the students. We've got really good programs in interactive media, theatre and film and TV production. Uh, the Digital Creativity Labs, which sponsored this event, um, and uh, you know we hope you had fun. And uh, we will actually have now a lights on and you can all come and, and talk to these lovely people directly for, for another 10 minutes or so. Um, so give them all a, a huge round of, uh, of applause. Thank you so much. <laughs>